If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to solve the question on your own before listening on. To solve part A, we will draw a picture of this water gun shooting the water horizontally outward from a height of 1.5 meters. And so here is that picture. And in order to calculate the time required to fall vertically down to the ground, we simply have to use some kinematics equations. And what it's important to note is that in the vertical direction, or the y direction if you prefer, the initial velocity of the water is actually zero meters per second. And the reason for that, of course, is because it's fired horizontally. So initially it's only moving in the x direction. That means in the vertical or y direction its initial velocity is zero. We also know that the acceleration in the y direction is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And then we have the vertical displacement of negative 1.5 meters. Notice we're calling it negative 1.5 meters because overall the displacement in the vertical direction is downward. And so we can turn to one of the formulas for kinematics to solve for the time. And here is that equation that we learned in an earlier chapter. Because the initial velocity is zero, that's actually going to knock away this term right here. And then we can solve this equation for the time by multiplying both sides of the equation by two. Multiplying the right by two actually cancels out the one half. We'll divide by the acceleration, so the acceleration cancels out, and then take the square root. We could then plug in the known values for the delta y and a. And when we simplify that, we can see that the time required for the water to hit the ground is roughly 0.553 seconds. So this would be the correct answer to part a of the question. Now on to part B, which tells us that the range of the stream is 8 meters. By range, they mean the horizontal distance that the water has traveled. So that would be this distance right here. We know that that's 8 meters. And we are asked to find the speed with which the stream leaves the nozzle. So in essence, they're asking for that initial horizontal speed that the water was fired. And so since that's a question of horizontal information, we can look at the x direction. And so we'll make it our goal to find that initial velocity in the x direction. We know the displacement in the x direction is 8 meters. We know the time in the x direction is the same time that we calculated earlier in part A. And then we also know the acceleration in the x direction is 0 meters per second squared because gravity, of course, doesn't act horizontally. We can turn back to the same equation that we used in part A to solve for the initial velocity. This time, though, since the acceleration is equal to 0, that's going to knock out this term here. We could then divide both sides of the equation by t in order to isolate that initial velocity, and then we'll plug in the known information for displacement and time. And when we do that, we can see the initial speed in the x direction is 14.5 meters per second. So this would be the correct answer to part A of the question. Excuse me, part B. So going back to the diagram, we can see that the velocity marked V2 is going to be the velocity that we just determined, 14.5 meters per second. Now the question in part C is asking us to take the areas of the nozzle and cylinder and then to use the equation of continuity to calculate the speed at which the plunger must be moved. The speed at which the plunger must be moved is denoted in the picture as V1. It might be a little bit hard to see, but right there V1 is the speed that the plunger is going to be moving with. And we can calculate that speed again by using the equation of continuity. So let's take a look at that equation. And that equation tells us that the product of area and velocity initially will equal the product of area and velocity in the final situation. Now we're solving for v1, which again is that speed of the plunger, so we can divide both sides of the equation by a1. For the areas, we can assume that the cross-sectional area of the plunger is circular as well as the nozzle of the gun. And so we can use the area of a circle for both a2 and a1. For a2, we could write it as pi times the radius 2 squared. And then for a1, we would have pi times the radius 1 squared. And again, that would be times v2. Of course, the pi's will cancel out, so we can simplify the equation. And then we can simply plug in the known information. Remember that v2 is 14.5. Radius 2 is going to be the radius of the nozzle of the gun. And the question notes that that radius is going to be 1 millimeter. We'll be careful to convert that into meters. So for that radius, we'll have 1 times 10 to the minus 3 meters, and then we still have to square it. And then radius 1 is going to be the radius of the larger tube, 
which was one centimeter. So that's going to be one times 10 to the minus two meters. And again, we'll square it and we'll plug in the 14.5 meters per second. And when we simplify that, we get 0.145 meters per second. So that's going to be the speed V1 at which the plunger must be moved and thus the correct answer to part C. For part D, what is the pressure at the nozzle? The nozzle, which is located right here, is open and therefore is exposed to atmospheric pressure. So that means that the pressure at this point right here is simply whatever the value of atmospheric pressure is. Well, the question notes that atmospheric pressure is assumed to be one ATM. That means that the answer for part D is going to be one ATM. If you prefer to express that as Pascal's, you would have 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascal. So this would be the correct answer to part D. No calculation required, just simply again recognizing that because the nozzle is open to the air, that the pressure right there would simply be the pressure exerted by the atmosphere. Now on to part E, which asks us to use Bernoulli's equation to find the pressure needed in the larger cylinder, and then can gravity terms be neglected? Well, here is Bernoulli's equation, and what we're going to do is notice very carefully, perhaps, that the larger tube is directly connected to the smaller tube. And so, in essence, their heights above the surface are the same. In other words, the height of this larger tube to the ground is going to be roughly the same as the height of the smaller tube to the ground. And as a result, we can say that Y1 is roughly equal to Y2. And that means that the gravity term here and here can be omitted from the equation. So when it asks, can gravity terms be neglected? The answer is yes, because we can assume that the height of the larger tube is roughly the same as the height of the smaller tube. And by making that simplification, that's going to allow us to calculate the pressure needed in the larger cylinder. Remember that the notation for the larger cylinder has subscripts of one. So basically we're trying to solve for P1. We can subtract this term over to the right-hand side We'll then notice that in this term here and here, we have a greatest common factor of one half times the density. So it's going to help us to factor that out. We could then go ahead and fill in the known information. Remember P2 was the pressure over here, which was the atmospheric pressure. And then rho, which kind of looks like a P here, is the density of the fluid, which in this case is water. We can look up the density of water and that has a standard value of 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. So we'll plug in all the known information, including the speeds. And when we crunch that all down, we should get a pressure of approximately 2.06 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. So this would be the correct answer to part E of the question. Finally, on to part F, which asks us to calculate the force that must be exerted on the trigger to achieve the desired pressure range or excuse me, the desired range of motion of the water, we know that force is equal to a pressure multiplied by an area. What we have to be careful about is actually to use the difference in pressure. And we know that because in parentheses here, it says that the force that must be exerted is due to pressure over and above atmospheric pressure, over and above atmospheric pressure. That means we need to take the pressure P1 and subtract the atmospheric pressure P2. And then for the area, we're just going to use the cross-sectional area of that larger tube. So that will be pi times the radius of the larger tube squared. So here are the known values plugged in. Notice again that this pressure right here is actually the difference between P1 and the atmospheric pressure, P2. When we calculate this force, we get approximately 33.0 newtons. So this is the correct answer to part F of the question. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, click the thumbs up and also subscribe. Remember, you can send in your own question to the email address on the screen and I'll do my best to post an answer to it on YouTube.